On September 6th, the US Army announced a plan for the M1E3 Abrams main battle tank. At the same time, the previous variant, M1A2 SCP V4, which was on the cusp of entering service, will not be procured or enter service. It's all part of a plan for urgent development of radically more capable and deployable Abrams compared to what the SCP V4 variant would offer. While not much is known about the E3 variant, which will likely get the A3 name in the end, this video will speculate on which design choices the future Abrams is most likely to use and why. Will it follow the Russian T-14 unmanned turret route? Watch the video to find out. Brigadier General Jeffrey Norman, director of the future Abrams project team, said they must optimize Abrams' mobility and survivability to allow the tank to continue to close with and destroy the enemy. Ground Combat Systems Executive Major General Glenn Dean said the Abrams can't grow its capabilities anymore without adding weight and that they need to reduce the tank's logistical footprint. He further stated that current wars highlighted a critical need for integrated protection for the crew, built from within, instead of being an add-on. It was also said that the E3 Abrams will include the best features of the SCP V4, that it will use modular open architecture standards, allowing quicker technology upgrades, and that it will enable the army to design a more survivable and lighter tank. Now, why is the tank called the E3? That nomenclature is not new, and it was used in the past to show an engineering change. For example, the original M1 Abrams had a M1E1 variant. The experimental Abrams tested with the 120mm gun, replacing the 105mm one of the basic variant. In 1985, the effort was renamed from M1E1 to M1A1. So what is the M1E3? It's an experimental engineering effort to prove a concept, but if all goes well, the plan is to use it and refine it to a serial standard tank, which would then, by all logic, be called M1A3, as that's the next free designation that shows off large enough changes compared to the M1A2. But then again, nothing is certain. For political and marketing purposes, it's also possible the next Abrams variant will have a more flashy designation. That remains to be seen. Initial operational capability is planned for early 2030s. That's roughly 10 years of development and testing. For modern day development timetables, that's not a lot of time. A completely new tank would likely require some two decades, but it does signify quite a bit of redesign for the Abrams. Exact wording those US officials used does offer some clues as to what we might expect. The army is to design a more survivable and lighter tank. That line is quite telling. How can future Abrams be both more survivable and lighter? Has some super secret new armor been discovered? Well, the answer to that can be an unequivocal no, but in all likelihood, future armor can be made magically sturdy and light. We've seen decades and decades of new armor solution applied to tanks. Increases in protection so far were gradual. A good deal of added protection also came from larger size and weight of armor. There's very little likelihood of that suddenly changing. So how can the Abrams be made more survivable and lighter? By moving all its crew out of the turret and into the hull of the tank. Historically, turret hits represented an ever greater share of hits to the tank over time. The greater distances became and the more top-down attack profiles of missiles have been used is the turret that got attacked more often. There are three crew members inside the current Abrams turret. The gunner, the commander and the loader. The driver sits outside the turret. There is a lot of real estate to be armored. Lots of square feet of armor are on the turret, even if the rear half of the turret is hardly armored. Once the depleted uranium armor variant of the Abrams came to be, the turret itself weighed in at almost 25 metric tons and that was still before the M1A2 variant. Since then, the Abrams grew in weight. The addition of the active armor protection systems alone added over 2 tons. It wouldn't be surprising if the SCP V4 variant weight was approaching 30 metric tons for the turret alone and 70 metric tons for the whole tank. 
US Army's own documents sometimes state that already the SCP V3 variant is so heavy that it's not safely transportable by current recovery vehicles, tactical bridges, or heavy equipment transporter trucks. So, what can be achieved by not having the crew in the turret? Suddenly, the important part of the turret, one housing the gun and the autoloader, could be made much, much more compact. Yes, moving the crew into the hull necessarily means an autoloader would have to be used. But that's really becoming the standard in most tanks designed from the 1990s onwards. Rheinmetall's Panther tank demonstrator, built upon Leopard 2, also features an autoloader. A year ago, General Dynamics, the maker of Abrams, came out with Abrams X demonstrator. We made a whole video about that, but in short, it features an unmanned turret, an autoloader, and three crew members sitting well protected inside the hull. Famously, the Russian T-14 tank is using the same general idea, with an unmanned turret. There are rumors and images suggesting the Chinese are at least looking into unmanned turrets. But such ideas are older than that. The US had a TTB testbed for the Abrams tank, with a tiny unmanned turret and an autoloader. That was in the 1980s. It was too early then to make sense, but now, as we're talking about the 2030s, the concept finally seems to be catching on. Imagine cutting down those near 30 tons of weight in half by having a small armored core around the gun and the loader. Yes, the turret itself may appear bigger, but much of it may be spaced armor, which is light, holding various sensors, such as pieces of the active protection system, which physically intercepts missiles with shotgun-like charges. With a clean slate design, the APS can be made more comprehensive and hold more charges. A year ago, US Army held a presentation from where a very blurry image of allegedly M1E3 design idea or depiction emerged. It too shows a smaller turret, which might support the unmanned turret idea. It's indicative that the Abrams X demonstrator, as per General Dynamics representative, weighs just 49 metric tons, without add-on armor. Also said was that Abrams X is 10 tons lighter than current US Abrams, which would indicate some 50 to 57 metric tons, with full armor. It's not just that there has to be less surface to be armored. With an unmanned turret, it's also possible to simply use thinner armor in places. Yes, the armor may be breached, but even if it means the gun is out of action, the entire crew still survived. That is actually what US officials hinted at too, as we've been seeing in many conflicts, from the war in Europe to Leo 2 operations in Syria and Merkava ops in Lebanon. Oftentimes tanks do get hit and even get neutralized, but not outright destroyed. While green crews can be trained in months, experienced crews take years. Keeping them alive is hugely important in wars, and tank hulls themselves can often be recovered and repaired after a while. Especially with modular sections, sometimes it may be enough to simply replace the damaged turret module with another one. While one might think that anti-tank weapons involve a lot of explosives, the opposite is true. Armor-busting tank rounds generally use no explosive, relying on heavy metal darts. Missiles rely on shaped charges, which use a fairly small explosive package intended to shape and propel a metal slug through the armor. In the end, both do most damage by sending tiny armor and penetrator splinters around the insides of the tank as the armor is breached. Generally speaking, a crew inside a hull would be well protected from most such hits to the turret. Even top-down attack missiles would likely be triggered by the top of the turret, and the hull itself would see little damage. It's also plausible that a less armored turret would allow for an even more protected hull. Again, where it matters, around a three-person crew module. Today, when so many threats come from above, it's not enough to just armor the hull from the front. US officials talking about next-generation Abrams said reducing tank's logistical footprint is important. Part of that comes from lowering its weight. A greater range of vehicles manipulating Abramses would be available but part of it likely refers to fuel usage. Coincidentally, it's again the Abrams X demonstrator that may hint at what may happen there. Whole power pack was changed, with gas turbine removed, and a hybrid diesel and battery power pack was installed. General Dynamics said the demo tank was 50% more fuel efficient than current Abrams, 
though the actual range on the Abrams is similar as less fuel is carried. That had to be done due to more room required inside the hull to house three crew members. As the Abrams X is a quick and dirty demo program, which mostly retains the regular Abrams hull, it can be expected that a more modified hull could be made more roomy. While the gas turbine allows for more torque and better acceleration, the Abrams X, aided by its electric motors, managed to better it. Ultimately, it's fairly clear the US Army is aiming at needing less fuel for their future tank. Of course, some of the systems from the current SCP V4 tank variant will cross over to the E3, but it's also likely some of those will simply proliferate to older tank variants as well. For example, the gun sending data to programmable rounds is already being envisioned to be implemented to SCP V3 variant. Third generation thermal sites are also a strong candidate. But while many general features of the Abrams X can be expected for the E3, no one really knows much at this point. The tank just started development. It may not end up looking a lot like the Abrams X. Even though it is suspicious General Dynamics would invest on its own to make the demo tank unless it had at least hints of US Army readiness to further invest into its technologies. The program announcement also had a collateral casualty. The SCP V4 variant has been in development for some years. The plan was to start fielding the V4 in numbers from 2025. That is now not happening. Instead, the V3 variant will be procured in small numbers each year until E3 development is done. One can only imagine that the savings from not actually producing the V4 will somehow save enough money that the E3 development can be accelerated, and that the US Army can somehow bridge the gap from the SCP V3 to the E3 slash A3. Early 2030s goal may still mean a whole decade. Will it all fall through? That is also possible. This is far from the first time M1A3 has been mentioned. In the late 1980s the A3 name was mentioned as something for the future when electrothermal or electromagnetic guns would be available. That didn't pan out yet. In the mid 90s it was weighed whether M1A2 SCP should be called M1A3 instead, but it was concluded changes were not profound enough to warrant it. In the late 2000s there was also talk of A3 and even M1E3 name as well. That engineering project was supposed to use elements of the cancelled FCS platforms and apply them to the Abrams. That fell through as well. So will it work this time? Who knows. But the Abrams can't go on just adding weight. Current wars show it may be too vulnerable attacked from the top. Something has to change and has to change quickly. 10 years is fairly quick in army development terms. So this time it may actually work and we might actually see a drastically different Abrams. Future and even current threats may explain why the almost ready V4 was cancelled. It may explain the urgency. Now it remains to see how quickly the funding will trickle into the program. And remember, Binkov may talk about war, but only real peace can bring us all together.